This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. So my name is Entrella. I work at the Joint Bioenergy Institute. I'm a staff scientist at the Berkeley Lab, and I'm going to tell you uh, some more about microbes. Now that last talk was a great example of how microbes um, are part of these core technologies that are being developed uh, to meet some of the broadest demands of our times and the demands that we are making on our planet. But um, in, in my talk, I'm going to talk about a slightly different kind of microbes, and I'm going to open with a very familiar image. This is an image from the 2010 Gulf oil spill. It's possibly one of the biggest man-made disasters. And for weeks afterwards, we thought we had destroyed that entire ecosystem. And we actually had no clue about how to mitigate this problem. Now, a couple of years later, much of that oil is gone. And a very powerful metabolism of this organism that exists in that environment had, to lo had a lot to do with uh, mitigation of this, of this um, disaster. Alcanivorax borcumensis is a very famous microbe now. And there are a lot of people studying it trying to understand why it does what it does and when it will do what it does. But this is hardly the only organism that is our secret friend in the environment. So I'm showing you some images from Arizona from 2012, last year, where there were these horrible dust storms, completely brought life to a standstill for a lot of people. And this primarily happened because we destroyed this beautiful, elegant cyanobacteria that form um, these mantles over the desert holding it down. These are biological soil crusts. They were alive. And we did a lot of damage in the desert causing these dust storms. You don't even have to go that far. Every protein in all your bodies and every organism that you know of contains at least one sulfur atom. And the sulfur is made available to us by the biological activity of these little microbes, such as desulfovibrio vulgaris. Vulgaris is the Latin for common. They are very, very common. They are all over the place. And their, their role in our lives is un, um, uncontroversial. The same chemistry that the sulfovibrio uses to convert, uh, to convert sulfates to sulfide is the chemistry one would use to convert heavy metals from its oxidized states, where it's soluble in water, to its reduced form, where it's no long, longer soluble in water. And why is this important? Because it allows you to biocontain this very, very toxic waste that we generate in our energy and nuclear and um, industrial practices. And it has profound implications on how we can mitigate damage in our environment and how we can live in harmony with our environments. So we've gotten very good. We've gotten very good at identifying who our friends are. But can we always understand what they will do and can we predict how they will behave in these environments? The environment is a very, very complex place with a lot of different parameters that are dictating the behavior of these organisms. The organisms are not much simpler either. I'm showing you a little schematic of a very small part of desulfovibrio and it's already pretty complicated. So you're at a place where you're trying to predict all these complicated parameters coming together and cross-secting with your microbe and you're trying to figure figure out how they operate. Can we really do that? Do we know when they will behave the way that we want them to behave? Well, survival in the environment, perceiving signals, is not something that only microbes do. We do it too, every day. That's why our species is here today. And at the end of the day, these parameters, these stimuli from our environment, being able to see, hear, touch our environments, and, and respond in the correct matter, manner, boils down to molecular me mechanisms. Um, and that is not much different for microbes either. 
they too have signaling systems that tells them what is happening in the environment so that they can figure out how their response would give them the fitness that they need to survive that environment. Just that in the case of microbes, it's a little bit immediate. They don't have the hierarchy of sophisticated vision or hearing mechanisms. It's very immediate. They have to see the signal, and they have to come up with the response immediately. Most microbes have signaling systems that basically um, are present on the, on the cell surface that they use to sense these, to sense their external stimuli, and then um, orchestrate their response. And their response is going to be sort of an aggregate of all the, of all the stimuli that they are um, perceiving. So that's good. We know a lot about these signaling systems in a lot of pathogenic bacteria because we've been studying them for a long time. But what about these environmental bacteria? Do we know? Do we know anything about them? Well, to give you an example of T. sulfovibrio vulgaris, my favorite organism, it was discovered in 1940, uh, maybe 30 years before I was born. Its genome sequence has been known for the last 10 years. And astoundingly, even though, it is the, even though it is the focus of a lot of different studies that focus on understanding how it will respond in the environment, applications designed around its activity, its signaling systems, until very recently, were completely unknown. So this is the knowledge gap that we are trying to bridge here. This is the, the gap in knowing what it can do and what it will do to be able to predict this is, is the thought of the day. Um, any one of these signaling systems, any one of them, could be something someone like me could study my entire life and still not understand fully. So we simply don't have to, to have the time to study them one at a time. So what we did is we devised a strategy to figure out as much as we could about the signaling systems in one fell swoop. And in two years, we managed to predict all the genes that are controlled by all the signaling systems in D-sulfovibrio. What that does it is gives us connection between the environment and this organism. We can now know that the carbon utilization of this organism relies not only on the ability of this organism to sense whether carbon is present or not, but also on nitrate stress, phosphate stress, oxidative stress, and two other unknown stresses we quite haven't figured out yet. What this gives us is an ability to know what the environment means to this organism. What is the connection? How does it see it and its environment? And when something dramatic changes in that environment, how will it respond? Now, in our, in our lives and in our beliefs, we always talk about living in harmony with our environment. As our demands on our planets increase exponentially, it's very important that we understand how, we can, how our secret allies are in the environment are behaving so as to be able to predict their response. And of course, since I didn't do this work alone, um, this is my team, and thank you very much. Uh -huh.